Segabits presents Sega Talk, a podcast talking all things with your hosts, George and Barry. Look, it's a giant talking egg. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the master here. Hello and welcome to Sega Talk. I'm Barry. With me is George. Hello, everybody. And on this very special episode, we are going to be talking about Daytona USA. And the reason for that is kind of because Daytona 3 USA Championship, the oddly named game, uh, was recently announced at the time of recording this, and it got us a little nostalgic, and we were thinking, oh, what should we talk about for the next Sega Talk? So obviously, Daytona was on the mind, so we're going to be talking about Daytona USA. So you can't escape it. This is our Daytona episode. <sighs> So, um, yeah, Daytona USA, it was a Sega AM2 game. It had a limited arcade release in 1993, but it did not see a full release until 1994. Um, I don't know how many of our listeners listening to this played it at the time. Maybe uh, we don't have a comment section, but if you want to write in and just tell us about your Daytona experiences, it would be cool to hear especially from people in 93 and 94, maybe even people who might have seen these limited releases. Uh, George, what what is your first experiences with Daytona, first off? Well, uh, my first experiences, I mean, it's just one of those games that was, like, everywhere growing up. Like, I feel like it was in the mall, like, in the 90s, and I think it was slowly got replaced with, like, Crazy Taxi, I think. Like, I remember Crazy Taxi and... And before that, it was Daytona USA was everywhere. I don't know if mm-hmm. it was over there in the East Coast, but I felt like almost every establishment had to have an, a Daytona USA machine. Yeah, I, I feel like Daytona USA in the early 90s was basically the Pac-Man of that era. Like, you go to about any arcade, you might see a single setup. You might see the um, beloved uh, eight-seater setup, which I've... I've seen not too long ago. Like, these things are still in arcades. And they're from 1993, 1994. Like, these things are old. Um, And, you know, we're not discussing the sequel too much, if at all, on this episode. But I gotta say, I never see the sequel anywhere. I see the original all the time. I agree. I feel like there's something about the original that really got people to put in the quarters, right? mm Mm-hmm. It's just a classic game. And what do you think about this game coming out in 1993? Like, can you imagine... Like, I, I did a little bit of research since we're talking about what it was like before it came out worldwide. According to what I read, the only thing they changed was the AI. So the game mm. looked exactly the same when it was in pre-release state. So can you imagine, like, going into a room, coming from Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, and then Sega's like... Check out this fucking arcade game we're working on. And it's Daytona <laughs> USA just blaring its music at you, going full speed 60 frames per second down the, the speedway. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And at that time, the arcades were a very special place because this was the place where you would see the, the next-gen tech. And as a kid, though, you weren't sitting there going, oh, this might be the next console in two generations. You were just thinking, this is the only place I can see this. This stuff's in 3D. It looks like, I mean, we did, I don't think Toy Story was out at the time, but like at that time, you're like, this is computer graphics. This is amazing. Yeah. And so, I mean, people would pump the quarters in just to experience that. But then what they also got was a really fun and memorable game, which we'll be talking about. Uh, a little further background information on the game it was Sega's first Model 2 arcade title showing off 3D graphics, as mentioned and texture mapper, mapping chip making, well, which made Daytona one of the first video games to feature filtered texture mapped polygons. That's a lot of technical words, but it's definitely um, a trailblazer in the industry. You can just look at virtual racing and then look at vir- Daytona USA and just see the leap that that did, you know what I mean? It's a totally... Oh, yeah. and- yeah, and I would definitely point to virtual racing as being essentially the first Daytona. It, it really, I mean, they're totally different game series. There was never any more virtual racing titles, but they, it was definitely a test bed. Yeah, and it was a very interesting, like, new look. And it's I feel like virtual racing was just, you know, what led up to Daytona USA and obviously the competition in, in the arcade space, which we'll be talking about right now. Mm-hmm. Hey, 
Daytona USA development was led by a young Toshihiro Nagashi. I always screw up these Japanese names, so bear with me and don't hate me. Uh, <laughs> they screw up your name, too. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Um, later on, he actually went on to do Super Monkey Ball and the Yakuza series, and he still works at Sega right now. But uh, this was supposed to be the successor for Virtual Racing. He was the director, producer, and chief designer. So he was 100% behind the project. And uh, he came to America before he did the project, Daytona USA, and he was looking for inspirations for a new arcade game. And he went to a NASCAR event, apparently, and he said that it was so exciting. The simplistic yet exciting nature of NASCAR is what kind of boggled his mind for this project. What do you think? Like, NASCAR... Did you get the NASCAR vibe growing up with this game? I, you know, um, we talked off air about this. Daytona USA never felt like a NASCAR game to me. And I guess the main thing is is it's not an actual official NASCAR game. It does feature stock car racing, but they're all fictional. You know, the Hornet. um, What was the the other one? Like the Stallion or whatever. Uh, You know, these these aren't real brands. They're just made up for the game. And so to me, they just were the colorful cars in this Daytona USA game. Um, they don't even utilize the actual Daytona International Speedway. That's a track that is going to appear in the upcoming Daytona 3. And so really, it was almost all original Sega outside of the Daytona name and the stock car racing. And so it it always felt like Daytona was Daytona to me. I never thought of NASCAR as a kid. And I guess you could say that it has some NASCAR influences since in the game you're supposed to be going up, you know... The, getting to number one after a couple of uh, laps but I, you know what I, I'm with you on this one I didn't think it was NASCAR I never really thought about NASCAR I used to just see the machine and I'm like that game looks really freaking great look at the 3D graphics and I want to play it yeah, yeah. I never thought like that's a NASCAR game I like <laughs> I, I have to like NASCAR to like that yeah and there were there was the pit crew but I always saw that as a hindrance like I, I rarely use the pit crew because if you use that you basically lose the race Exactly, and then they also had a, some sort of pit crew in the virtual racing, and I never thought of that as a NASCAR game either. True, true. And not really a pit crew, but you know in the beginning when they put your wheels on and then those those ugly little figures come out with the tires? <laughs> the creepy looking guys, like <laughs> distorted yeah. Virtua Fighter characters who like are not fully born. Yeah, exactly. They weren't fully cooked, that's for sure. Ugh. Um the reasons that um, the reason that Sega really tried to push Daytona USA and it's, it's because the competition, uh, Namco was like Sega's biggest competition in the, in the mid-90s. They had Tekken, and, and Sega had Virtual Fighter. And they had Ridge Racer, and Sega had Daytona USA. Um, so Sega wanted Daytona USA to take on Ridge Racer, which is a new franchise by Nam- uh, Namco. And uh, what do you think? You think that Daytona USA did what it had to do? Oh, for sure. I, I still think Ridge Racer is a very popular series, but it's something you don't see that much in arcades nowadays. I, I've never been to an arcade in the past 10, 15 years and spotted a um, Ridge Racer cabinet. And, you know, home console, I feel like it was a popular PlayStation series, but I feel like Daytona in the arcades eclipsed it totally. Yeah, I agree. I think they did the job it was supposed to, and I, they say it's namely because in 1994, it had state-of-the-art graphics. It was running at 60 frames per second with multiple opponents on screen, which is something that Ridge Racer couldn't do at the time. So they totally took the whole technical pie, and they took the sales. I think, yeah, Ridge Racer is definitely a more popular franchise in the home console space because I remember everybody that I used to know talking about Ridge Racer that owned a PlayStation, you know? Mm-hmm. But you, ne- even though Sega Saturn fans would say the Tony USA was a great game, the Sega Saturn version wasn't that great. So it wasn't something that took off in consoles, I think. I agree. Um, and even the Dreamcast version, Daytona USA 2001, it had its problems too. You know, they tried to replicate it. And even um, Nagoshi worked on that, I believe. And it just, it, it didn't do it for everyone. I also wanted to mention Nagoshi... We don't know if he's involved in Daytona 3, but it's entirely likely that he played some part. He might be a producer. So, And, and he's pretty important because like, he was the guy, chief designer, producer, and director. Oh, yeah. That's pretty big. I think only Yu Suzuki did stuff like that. I mean, this was his baby. And, you know, it, it's funny. You, you look at Monkey Ball, Yakuza. You would think those, you know, those are so far apart from Daytona. But really, Monkey Ball 
It's a very colorful, wacky game, even Daytona's wacky. And Yakuza, as Japanese as those games are, there are some really weird, like, Americanized things that come out of left field in those games. Oh, for sure. He's always been into the whole wackiness of it. Yeah. Um, here's a quote uh, talking about the competition with Namco. This is by Takanobo Matsuyoshi. He's the composer of uh, Daytona USA. He said, When Rage Racer debuted, we were working with the Model 2 to create a new system for polygon surfaces. We received an order from the company to make something better than Ridge Racer. It was a priority order, not just to create the highest quality music, but also the best visual designs and smoothest motion. We had to beat the game in sales too. That was actually the core concept of the project, to outdo R Ridge Racer. So here it is. Like, <laughs> Sega's like, give me the best game ever. It has to be the smoothest motion, best visual design, and you have to beat this game in sales. Like, I agree they did everything right. That's a lot of pressure to have on a, on a team like that, right? That is a tall order. I mean, the only other team I can really think of that had something that might beat that is Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic Team, where they yeah. said beat Mario. And it was also the t at the time when nobody beat Mario. Like, And I don't think anybody's ever beaten Mario in the platforming part of it ever since. Daytona USA, it was a simple concept. You pick from three tracks. You pick manual or automatic. There isn't really any... Um, car selecting st stage you know you're not going through a menu flicking through all these cars and all you have to do is outrun the competition and finish the race before the time runs out and so you know this was to many they saw this as probably the most simple arcade racer and also probably the most perfect one it's very pick up and play there were three selectable tracks beginner advanced and expert and these three were um, in order 37 Speedway, which is iconic, Dinosaur Canyon, which I guess is iconic, and then Seaside Street Galaxy. What a weird name. And um, each of these tracks had their own Easter, Easter eggs. So, for example, Sonic the Hedgehog could be seen carved into the side of a cliff in 37 Speedway, and tons of other ones. And we'll get into those. I did want to ask you, George, um, what's your choice, manual or automatic? Dude, automatic. When I was a kid, I was pretty terrible at remembering to shift, so I would always put it automatic, so I just played automatic. What about you? Uh, I did automatic as a kid, but nowadays I try manual just so I can play around with the arcade machine more, but I suck at it. Does it make a big difference playing manual? It just makes you feel more involved and more in control. I mean, even you talk to people who drive manual transmission in real life, and they always go, I just like feeling more in control with my car. And I'm like, I just like having my hands free. So, <laughs> you know. To so, I could sw so I could switch my, uh, my iPod and I could get the music I want. Exactly. Um, and then as for the tracks, you know, beginner, advanced, and expert, I always would go for beginner just because I was like, well, I want to be able to play it well. Which, looking back, I, I really regret because I didn't get to play Dinosaur Canyon and Seaside Street Galaxy as much as I could have. And I can still go to the arcades or, you know, play it on my Saturn, but I'm not as, I'm not as into those stages. I like them, but, you know. I agree with you. Like, I remember uh, I always play 3-7 Speedway because the same reason. I didn't want to lose my quarter and then have to put another quarter in and then hopefully I did well. But I really like Seaside Street Galaxy, like the expert course. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just didn't play it that much because I was intimidated. I was, I'm was i never really that good at driving games. I enjoy them, but I'm not good at them. Talking about, uh, what was your favorite Easter egg in this game? I mean, as a kid, I loved Sonic the Hedgehog, so seeing him in the mountain was always really cool. But you get hit with so many Easter eggs in that short moment because there's also the um, the uh, the fruit machine. You know, you've got the, um, the three reels there that you match. Now, uh... Remind me, what, what did that do if you matched them? What would you get? I have no idea. You, <laughs> you're, t you're asking the person that never did it, so I would never know. Yeah, I don't think I ever hit it either. I always th thought you would get like extra time or something, but um, man. I I'm, sure I there's somebody, I'm sure <laughs> there's somebody listening in and going, these guys are idiots. They're not Daytona experts, which I should bring up. What I love so much about AM2 and Daytona is that you don't need to be an expert to love their games. I'm not a huge fighting, you know, like aficionado, but I love Virtua Fighter. I'm not a huge racing guy, but I love Daytona USA. It seems like they they 
always did a really good job making these very simple, perfected versions of a genre and then offering it up and just about anyone could pick up and play it. And even if you're not an expert, you'd have a great time, but you could become an expert at the game. That's true. And uh, they also had these like arcade cabinets. We talked about them before. There was the eight uh, c- uh, arcade cabinet that was linked. That one was huge. It's fantastic looking. They had the live camera giving spectators a view of the race. Um, do you think these little things kind of made people... I mean, when you walk into a place of establishment, you know, mm-hmm. you see an arcade cabinet, do you think that, that it, the Tony USA was eye-catching? Oh, for sure. I mean, like I said, uh, there was a Dave & Buster's near me when I lived in uh, Philadelphia, and that machine had... Uh, it was an eight-cabinet machine. It was always in use. And this was probably like three years ago. So, and this was the original Daytona. Kids were still playing it. When you see the size of that machine, you got to try it with your friends. And it's one of the few games, usually in the arcade, that you can play with a bunch of friends. The only ones I can really think of that were equally popular was, um, I don't know if you've ever played it, The Grid from Midway. I've never played The Mid, I mean The Grid. Yeah, it's it's really fun. I mean, it's completely off topic here, but it's another game where when you see these lined up, you're like, I got to get a bunch of my friends to play this. This looks fun. Well, there's one more thing about this game that a lot of people don't know. Like, the AI for this game was kind of advanced for the time because, um, let's say that you were winning, the AI would actually get tougher on you and would try to get you out of the race. If you were shitty at the game, it would try to get out of your way so you could try to get ahead of them. So you kept it competitive, so you always felt like you were being competitive. And this is something that wasn't really thought about when people would go to arcades people they were just thinking about taking your quarter and that's it do you think that kind of Hmm. gave the game a little bit of edge giving people a fun gameplay experience instead of a challenging gameplay experience oh i agree because people you know you remember when you go to an arcade and you drop in a quarter you remember the games that screw you over you remember the ones where you're like wow i got to play for five not even five minutes maybe two minutes and then i'm i'm done Whereas with Daytona, it gives you a sporting chance, even if you're not great at it. That's true. And uh, I think that's a better experience. I think you want to give people the, the good experience. Like, they want to walk away from there. And it felt like that's something that Sega AM2 tried to do. I think we talked about this when we talked about OutRun, about how they kind of wanted you to feel something when you left that arcade. It wasn't just you putting in a quarter, getting ripped off, and then leaving. They kind of gave you that mellow, uh, what is it, melancholy Mel- Mel- music. Mm-hmm. Uh, they try to give you a feeling before you leave. And this one, I think the same thing. They wanted to make you feel like, I fought for that win, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I think that's what makes a successful arcade game, is it's not selling you so much a game as it's selling you a feeling. Something that you remember, you know, for years. Because when you see that Daytona cabinet, you're not thinking, oh yeah, gameplay. You're thinking, oh. The whole experience, the music, the graphics, the the quirky Easter eggs, which I do want to get back into. There's some more I did want to want to cover here. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, there's the um, the Saturn version has some wacky things. There's the horse. Remember the horse? Oh yes, I remember the horse. Everybody remembers the horse. Yeah. <laughs> I was at the arcade not too long ago, and I couldn't remember if the horse was in the arcade version, so I had my phone out and I was trying to find the cheats and then I realized I'm like sitting in the machine looking for a horse I had to stop but um, and you're everything that that the arcade players hate they're like that guy yeah exactly on his phone on his Facebook Um, you can also switch between kilometers per hour and miles per hour though to be fair it's USA so it should always be miles per hour Um, exactly and then the uh, the arcade version they had um, you know the different music which um, I believe we're gonna cover briefly but you could uh, play a um, secret bonus track, which is kind of cool. Then there was also the um, the funny little addition of that cave. If you drove in the wrong way on Dinosaur Canyon, you would go up this little um, like secret cave. You'd go inside, and it would say on the wall, "Congratulations, you just lost your sponsors." That's a good one, right? So, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. But um, anyway, so it's it's a very quirky game, and there's all these fun little Easter eggs. So you know. I feel like when you're in arcades and you're with friends, nothing shows more street cred than when you're like, hey, check out this secret I found in an arcade game. You know, it's it's cool. And that's what, you know, you get the myths going and then kids are like, oh man, did you hear? So-and-so was at, at the arcade, he was playing Daytona and he found a cave. And no one would believe it. 
And then when you see it for yourself, you're like, this is insane. Well, my dad works at Sega, and he told me that there's a cave in there, so I agree with that. Right. <laughs> Remember that when you're when you're a kid, the guy, the kid that had the dad that worked at Sega. Oh my God, I could tell you stories. I had a friend who claimed that he had a Nintendo Game and Watch, and every time he would beat a stage, another screen would appear. <laughs> And I, I, I grilled him. I said, so wait, how many stages are there? And he's like, there's like 20. And I'm like, so it's 20 screens tall? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good luck. And I said, bring it in. And he goes, I will, but my brother won't let me. <laughs> and you had to believe him, dude. You had to take his word for it. <laughs> I believed him. To this day, I still think there's a 20 screen uh, game and watch out there. And I'm pretty sure he's wait- <laughs> He's probably going to be listening to this and giving you a picture, and then you're going to eat crow. Yeah, Philip, if you're out there, please. <laughs> I was going to say, um, let's talk about the music for this game. Yeah. It was an iconic soundtrack, let's be honest here. Because the music was bizarre compared to what you were playing, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And do you think that kind of gave it, like, when you walk into the arcades and, you know, they blare the arcade music everywhere? I remember a long time ago, uh, I went to watch a movie and the, and the cinema left the, the, the door open. And I could hear the House of the Dead Machine the whole time when I'm watching a movie. Terrible. <laughs> Don't do that if you work at a cinema. But this is one of those erasing games that also was in cinemas a lot. And uh, it had an gr- uh, iconic soundtrack. It was written by Takanobi Matsuyuchi. I probably said that wrong again. <laughs> sure. It, I, said it, I said it differently the first time and the second time. So Takanobu Whatever. Mitsuyoshi. And he said, I remember reading an interview a long time ago, that... Um, he Sega just told him do whatever you want for the soundtrack, and he's just started writing music that he would want to listen to. He said, "But if you <laughs> listen to Namco's uh, Ridge Racer music, and then you listen to his, there's a lot of influence there. Like, it's very cool, jazzy. Uh, there's even some scatting on this on this uh, Daytona USA soundtrack. What are your thoughts about the soundtrack? And do you think it should have been changed, or do you like what he was trying to do? Well, I mean." You know, as a huge fan of the game, the soundtrack just goes hand in hand with it. But if I'm looking at it from the perspective of someone who's never seen this game before, it is really weird. It's a really weird soundtrack. You've got this Japanese guy who, uh, he does speak English, but, you know, he has a very interesting accent. You know, I mean, people would make fun of it going, blue, blue skies. Um, But it works. And as weird as it is and I think one of the things that really makes it work and I always I always look at this as a sign of a a well-designed arcade game is if you have a really good intro hook for the title screen when you walk into the arcade and you know it keeps cycling you're gonna hear it so with the House of the Dead for example there's that organ that and then with um, Crazy Taxi there's the revving up and then the guy going hey 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 come on over you know like a carnival barker and I think it uses that sort of kind of classic Carnival Barker uh, mentality when you have him going, do, 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 you know, like you hear that in the arcade, you're going to know there's a Daytona machine. It doesn't oh, take much. It's that beautiful sound, you know. It's like, yeah, hey, is that my people calling me over there? <laughs> yeah. And so they could have gone with, you know, a very basic rock and roll kind of soundtrack, but it would have blended in. You would have heard it and you would have been like, what machine is that? But as soon as you hear his vocals, and he, he very oddly, he narrates the race. Like, he's almost a character in the game, you know, in, in the sense that he'll say rolling start when you're doing a rolling start. And then he'll, his song will be about, like, this is the crew chief, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and as a kid, when I play that, and even now when I hear that, I'm like, he's the crew chief. For sure. Like, that's his character. (laughs) You know? Like, what else is it? And why is this guy singing to me over my headphones? Like, I'm trying to race, and the guy's going, This is the guru chief. I like, he's like a, (laughs) like, he's the guy holding your hand through this race, you know, with beautiful music, you know? Yeah, he's like the spirit of Daytona, really. For sure, and I'm and I'm glad that he's back for three, For if the rumors are right. I mean, they haven't really officially said who's there out of Sega, but we have it in good authority that he's going to be back, and That's he right. deserves it. He's a and he did a, he did a fantastic track for um, Virtual on Force not too long ago. I love that one, too. He, um, but yeah, I love the soundtrack. I think uh, it fits now that we know about it. I mean, if you think about it, if you just went with a generic soundtrack, he would have gotten lost in the sea of noise in those arcades. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. you have to be weird when you're in arcades, and I think that's why we like Japanese video games. They're freaking weird. We love weird stuff. Oh, yeah. 
And let's let's all have our fingers crossed that he is coming back for three because they're doing three new tracks as well as the three original ones. So we could conceivably have remixes or the originals and then three new songs from him, which would be awesome. I'd love that. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, let's talk about a little bit more about the Sega Saturn port that was released in 1995. Do you think that the Sega Saturn port hurt the Sega Saturn sales? Because it was one of those highly anticipated games and it ran a low frame rate. I think it was like 20 frames per second. It had bad 3D models, really bad draw distance, and it didn't really bide well for the Sega Saturn, you know? Why would you buy a Sega Saturn when it was more expensive than PlayStation and PlayStation had a Ridge Racer port that was perfect? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's when Sega really dropped the ball there because and I mean, Saturn had a lot of issues, like not launching with a Sonic game, things like that, but don't mess up. <laughs> you know, don't mess up Daytona. I also feel like they kind of messed up Virtua Fighter too, right? Because they later yeah. re released Virtua Fighter Remix. Like, you don't take your big name arcade titles and then sell this console to people saying, you know, this is an arcade in your home. Here's Daytona USA and here's Virtua Fighter. Oh, by the way, we messed up. Can you please buy the remakes, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and they, and they also did that with Daytona USA. They released, later on, the same year, I think, Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition. And this one was handled by Sega AM3 and the guys that did the Sega Rally port. And uh, it was a little bit better, but it wasn't perfect still. I mean, I think the Sega Saturn just was not strong enough in 3D. It was a 2D powerhouse. And do you think, I mean... The whole 3D thing, I, you remember the mid-90s? Do you think that we were going so much into 3D that that's something that the Sega Saturn kind of doomed itself with? I mean, it, I think it was necessary to to be competitive. Looking back, I, I feel like people wished it had more 2D games. Like, looking back now, people go, oh man, they could have done an awesome 2D Sonic game. But you got to remember, at the time with Sega Saturn, 3D was all the rage. It's unfortunate because I feel like it wasn't quite there yet and they really should have perfected it before they did that. Like, you know, I know, I know love, a lot of people love the PlayStation and Nintendo 64, but I feel like a lot of those games now are unplayable or at least very difficult to play without that in mind, you know? It's kind of like early silent m movies where you're like, man, these special effects are awful, the pacing's off. Yeah, and I think you and know. I think that's one of the reasons I kind of like the Sega... I really loved the Sega Saturn at the time. I just wasn't one of those people that gave into the 3D thing. I loved my occasional 3D game, but like at the time, I didn't feel like it was all the way like it should have been. Like I felt like Sega still had... A, there's still a market for 2D. I think Street Fighter Alpha was going on at the time, and Street Fighter 3 was going to be 3, I mean 2D. I felt like there was a market and it was it was a weird time for sure. Mm -hmm. It's like a transitional period. Okay, so when they re-released uh, Daytona USA on the Sega Saturn, they also had a, a new soundtrack that had remixed music by Richard Jock and uh, Jun, Jun Senyo. Jun Seno. The guy that does the Sonic soundtrack now. Uh, they did the remix for this soundtrack and uh, what do you think about the remix soundtrack? It's, it's good. I mean, those are some pretty big names for Sega fans. I mean, especially Sonic fans. Um, RJ, he, he's done some really classic songs. I love his Sonic R soundtrack. Um, so, you know, good stuff. But I, I don't think you can beat the original. Yeah, and this is before they were huge names. So, something to look out for if you don't have the championship uh, circuit edition and you want new music, or at least new remixed music... Check it out, it's probably worth a, a double dip on your Sega Saturn collection. For sure. There was also a PC version that had better graphics than the Sega Saturn. Not really worth talking about because, I mean, I don't think we played it. Did you play it as a kid? Nah, I didn't have a PC strong enough. The only games I played as a kid that were Sega was um, Virtual Fighter because one of my uh, computer labs at school had Virtual Fighter installed on it. Oh, wow. And it, it was pretty cool to play, so that's my little... Uh, that's the only reason I like computers, dude. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they did release a special version of it called uh, Daytona USA Deluxe Special Edition on PC. But it was just one track, Dinosaur Canyon, and it was reskinned to be filled with Skittles advertisements. And they only produced 100,000 copies. Uh, copies of the game kind of go a little bit, you know, a little rare on uh, eBay, but what isn't rare on eBay? Right. 
What What are your thoughts on this Skittle advertisement release? That is, I mean, you showed that to me, I think, a week ago. It is bizarre, but I mean, it's it's not that surprising. It's just it's just kind of funny that it's like Skittles Daytona, and you know, I mean, Skittles is still a thing. Maybe we can get Daytona Three Skittles Edition or something like that. Ooh, I would love that. Yeah. I mean, they're doing weird advertisement. You never know. The company might be up for it. Yeah. They also kind of did this Sega, like, this was a time where they were doing a lot of these, like, weird little releases where they would get a team to do something and then release a, a thing as a promotion. Like, Knights had um, Christmas Nights as a promotion. Mm-hmm. So it's not something old. I mean, new. It's something they were doing at the time. I wonder if it worked out for them. Probably not. Yeah, we don't really think about it that much until you mentioned it to me last week, so... I don't probably not, since the Sega Saturn failed. <laughs> okay, and then Sega, we talked about this a little while ago, where they remade Daytona as Daytona USA 2001, or in the North America, it was just called Daytona USA. And uh, it featured everything from the Championship Edition from the Sega Saturn, plus three new tracks. Uh, and each track was playable in reverse mirrored and reverse mirrored mode because why not right Mm -hmm. and it had uh, online multiplayer improved graphics uh, but the controls weren't there for a lot of fans what are your thoughts on the Dreamcast version I mean it looks nice and um, you know I'm happy to own it I've played it with I don't think I've played it with a racing wheel it's really difficult to play with the controller though it's just I mean, it. I, yeah, it definitely isn't up to par with the original, unfortunately. I've heard that the Japanese one controls differently from the American one. Maybe I'm wrong. That controls might be a little tighter. But I hate when that happens, because then it's like, do I have to import it if I want something a little bit better? Um, in, it's worth checking out this now, is also, for sure. Yeah, and this is the time, too, when Sega was kind of like... We, we sit here and we go like, oh, Sega's rushing games right now. I think it's more glaringly obvious now because games are more complicated today than they ever have been to make. But I think even then when it was simple, these teams were rushed. And you could tell by all these Daytona ports. Daytona made a bajillion dollars in the arcades, but yet somehow we can't have a good home port since until like 2012. We haven't had a good home port of the arcade version. Yeah. So it's kind of surprising, honestly, if you think about it. Because... It would make money. Maybe they were sabotaging us so uh, the arcade version could make more money. Potentially. Duh. Potentially. (laughs) God damn it. So let's talk about some of the the era. We like to do this in every episode. We like to talk about what was happening in America in in 1994, at least in the media standpoint. So let's talk about the games that came out in 1994. These are the popular games in 1994. And I did not include Daytona USA because we're obviously talking about it. Mega Man X. What do you think about Mega Man X? You a big fan? I'm not a big Mega Man fan, but uh, I've played X. It's a cool game. It, I uh, like Mega Man X growing up. It yeah. was a pretty cool anime style uh, game. Sonic 3. You ever heard of that one? Um, I'll be honest. I, I haven't played Sonic 3. I've heard it's good. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I love Sonic 3. Um, but it just goes to show what Sega was doing at home compared to what they were doing at arcades. Imagine playing Sonic 3 and then going to the arcade, seeing the Sega name on Daytona. Like, that's a huge step up. Oh, it's a huge step up. This is, that's what I'm saying. It's like futuristic stuff in the arcades. Um, Final Fantasy VI debuted. Um, not a real big Final Fantasy fan, are you? I've played 7, 10, and Kingdom Hearts, which doesn't really count. But um, I don't I don't know too much about six, unfortunately. Baby Barry wasn't uh, wasn't in line for this one. Nah, too difficult. Uh, the King of Fighters debuted, which is now on its fourteenth release. Earthworm Jim debuted, and get this, the Need for Speed series debuted this year on the 3DO, and <laughs> this is considered, according to Wikipedia, the most successful racing game of all time. Did you ever play Need for Speed growing up? I didn't, and I'm surprised that it was the 3DO. Like, you call it the most successful racing game of all time, or series, but it started on the 3DO, which was a massive failure. Oh, yeah, of course, he changed it, and it actually sold after that the 3DO died, but... Right. Yeah, I agree with you. The 3DO was a massive failure. You ever play a 3DO back in the 90s? I did. I played a 3DO which had, oh, man, um, Burn Cycle. As it was playing on it, and it was at um, 
a Dayton's department store in Minneapolis. It was a uh, demo unit. It was cool. Uh, as a kid, I used to have a neighbor that had it, and he would let me go over there to play it, and I was like, Samurai Showdown, this is the... Because it had the zoom in. Sega Genesis version didn't have that great of a zoom. Mm-hmm. But this one had such a smooth, smooth, and I was so into fighting games at the time that I was like, I want a 3DO. Oh, and man. I begged my parents, like, give me a 3DO, and I'm so glad I didn't because it failed. <laughs> you dodged that bullet. <laughs> I dodged it. Um, and I think the Sega Saturn had a better uh, 2D fighting library, even if it died. Um, System Shock came out, and this is a huge game on PC, and a lot of people think that it's one the best video games of all time. I always see it on articles and stuff every time it has an anniversary. Did you ever play System Shock? System Shock. I'm trying to remember it. Um, looking at pictures, I don't think I've ever played that. Yeah, it's a, it's more of a PC game. I think me, I mean, at least I was. I was more of a console boy, I guess. My parents never had a PC, so I wouldn't be able to play it when I was a kid. I was a I was a console boy. I did have a PC though. I had an IBM PS1, and so I would play Commander Keen. I would play <laughs> Hugo's House of Horrors. Did you ever hear about that? No, I never. Oh, Hugo is so fun. Um, but no, I've never played those big those big uh, I guess uh, hardware <laughs> heavy games. I guess I just didn't have a computer that was up to it. Computers are expensive back then, too. It's not like today where you could just get them for under a grand if you really want, and they could run almost anything. No, and you know, around that time, the big deal in our house was that we got a Disney Sound Blaster, which was a special speaker. It looked really weird. It was like a flat speaker, and it only worked with select games, but it added voices to your game. So we had Roger Rabbit and Dick Tracy, and you'd play it, and Dick Tracy would go, you know, like, speak up, buster, spill the beans, and you're like, oh my god. Did that, did, did, that, did that pucker up your butthole when you were playing it? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I would play that game all the time. Roger Rabbit would talk. He'd be like, Eddie, please. Whatever. Please. <laughs> uh, we also had uh, Killer Instinct debuted on the Super Nintendo. Uh, this is a big year for Super Nintendo, for real. And uh, Donkey Kong Country. And then Tekken uh, came out in arcades, which is the competitor to a little game called Virtual Fighter. Have you ever played it? Huh. Yeah, yeah. So... You know, that's... No, I was just, that's interesting, you know, because you bring up, like, Donkey Kong Country. These were games that were on home consoles that were, you know, it was a 2D game, but they were trying to push this 3D graphics look, even if they weren't actually in 3D. So it was definitely a transition period for home consoles. For sure, and I think, um, I think we, Sega had it right. I think the 2D, the 3D in Daytona, like, I don't know, I remember reading... Growing up, like, oh, this is what 3D in the home looks like, and it was like Star Fox. So they were showing Star Fox, and they're like, this is the future of 3D, and I'm thinking as a kid, have you went to the arcades, man? Have you seen the games they have in arcades? This is not 3D. Mm-hmm. I, I remember a lot of people knowing, like, in the in the schoolyard, being really excited about how 3D uh, Star Fox looked. And yeah, it was the best you could get in, in home, but in the arcade, yeah, that's a, that's a real 3D. Out of these lists of games that came out in 1994, not counting Daytona USA, which one is your game of the year? Oh, Sonic 3, hands down. Sonic 3? See, I'm going to have to go, and I know people are going to be like, what the fuck, George, you're fucking gay. (laughs) Um, I'm going to go with Mega Man X. I really, really love that game, and uh, it was... Sonic 3 is a great game, don't get me wrong. I just felt like it was half a game, and I also felt like it was just another Sonic game. I mean, I know... It's not a bad thing being another Sonic game, it really isn't. But I felt like the Mega Man franchise got a different tone, a different look, and it was kind of rebooted. And it was and it was more my liking. I was really into anime as a kid, like looking at it on TV, because it's just bizarre, colorful cartoons, and this game kind of did that for me. Mm-hmm. So I would have to go with Mega Man X. And yes, you could hate me for that. I don't hate you. Um, let's talk about some of the popular movies and see which one of these movies defined our 1994 experience in America. Okay. Uh, we, we have, uh, Interview with a Vampire. I put this on here because why not? Um, that's not going to be one of our movies we like, by the way. <laughs> D2, The Mighty Ducks, and this is my jam right here, so I was got to say about that. That's a good pick. Time Cop. Time Cop is a pretty fucking genuine Time movie. Time Cop. That's where he he pushed the villain into himself and then it like exploded, right? Oh yes, that movie's so good. Two people <laughs> cannot occupy the same space, or something. And that's like. how I. Fi- 
See, we, we know everything about time travel oh. because of Time Cop. Yeah. It's the best Arnold. I mean, uh, what's his name? Oh, fuck. Jean Claude Van Damme movie of all time. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, I love that every single plot of his movies always has to do with his wife dying and him trying to save somebody. <laughs> And he never wanted any of this to happen. I remember they would do Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, marathons. And I don't know what channel did it, but during the promos, they'd, they'd go, Van Damme, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty That's pretty good. Yeah. And it's funny because a lot of his movies are all the same plot, let's be honest. I kind of want to yeah. watch some of them now. After this, we'll, you'll be able to watch them. Uh, Pulp Fiction, and that's a big movie for Quentin Tarantino at the time. And it's mm. probably his biggest film. Uh, Ace Ventura... <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire, uh, Dumb and Dumber, and mm-hmm. uh, I put Angels in the Outfield because you said to put it on here. I never watched it. So, yeah. so which one is your movie of the year? Man, I mean, I didn't see it at the time, but Pulp Fiction, I feel, was the biggest movie of that year. But as a kid, I probably, I didn't like Jim Carrey as a kid, but I'd have to say he did three movies in one year, I believe. Ace Ventura, Dumb and Dumber, and wasn't it The Mask? Oh my god, this guy was like filming his comedy movies like a like a young woman films a pornography career. Yeah. Like and, all and, back to back. And I actually, I tweeted it out a while ago on our Twitter account. It was from my yearbook. And it was me talking about like what defined um, actually 1995 for me. And, and it was like, what was your favorite movie and what was your least favorite movie? And I said, uh, Ace Ventura 2 is my least favorite movie because I just had enough of Jim Carrey at that point. He was pretty annoying. I think we... I don't know what the hell people were thinking letting him go. But I feel like it's the same thing with us and Seth Rogen. Yeah. I think in 20 years when they see him back, they're going to be like, this guy's annoying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Smoking weed. Yeah. I, love him, bro. I feel like he's... I, not to turn this into the Jim Carrey podcast, but I think we just had too much Jim Carrey in one year. So, what would you want to be your movie of the year? I'm going to go with T2. Same thing. The Quack Attack is back, Jack. Mm-hmm. Filmed in Minnesota, so I, I definitely had uh, some stake in that movie. See, when I was a little kid, I wish I was from there. I didn't even know where it was filmed, but I'm like, wherever these guys are at, that's where I want to be. Because I want to play, st- play street hockey, you know? And yeah. uh, we didn't have that in California. Nobody could give a shit about hockey in California. The knuckle puck? The knuckle puck, yes. And the flying V, dude. That's how you make yeah. every goal. <laughs> that's how you win every game. When I was in gym class, we would play like... um. You know, like you just run around with the like a ball and like the sticks, and we would be like, if we do the knuckle puck and the flying V, we could win this. And did you guys win it? Nah. <laughs> but uh, there you go. D two is our movie of the year. You guys can tell us what your movies are. Write into us. We want to hear who you guys like. Anything else you want to add about Daytona three or Daytona one? Daytona one. You know, I like I say in every episode so far. If you can find this game in arcades, play it as soon as you see it. And um, especially now, because it's rare to find it. I, I don't think it's as rare as some other games. I still think that Daytona USA and um, House of the Dead 2 are still some of the most prevalent classic Sega arcade games that you're still going to find in places like Dave & Buster's, Gameworks, things like that. But with Daytona USA 3 on the horizon, they might be phasing out their original Daytona cabinets because this, you know, Daytona 3 is going to bring in a lot more people, and it's newer, and if things break down on it, they can actually still get parts. I hope you're right about that because I don't think they will take them apart, like, get, get rid of them because I feel like Daytona 2 didn't do that, and I feel like Daytona 3 won't, and I think that's probably Sega's biggest fear. But who knows, it's been a long time. I mean, Daytona USA came out in 1994, the sequel came out in 1998. So I'm assuming that it's been such a long time that this one has a bigger chance of actually dethroning the mm-hmm. original. I mean, yeah, if you, if you want to get into a little industry talk, like, you know, we, we did do a Sega News Bits, which is our other uh, little show that we have on YouTube, and we talked about Daytona 3. And I feel like the big buy will be arcades that are new and they don't have the original Daytona or arcades where they always wanted the original Daytona and they just thought, yeah, it's a little old. Like, should we really be adding that? Yeah. If you enjoyed this show, please email us at segabits at gmail.com. Share your comments, questions, concerns. We especially would love to hear um, maybe suggestions for other Sega things that we can talk about. And remember, it's not just games, it's consoles. 
developers, events, we're really, we're open to anything interesting. L look for us on iTunes, give us a rate, a review, only positive reviews. Make it good. Yeah, because if yeah. you do a negative review, I heard, they uh, they sent Donald Trump to your house and he yells at you about <laughs> building a wall. So you don't want that to happen. So just, no. just give us a positive review. That's it. That's all that you have to do. Yeah. And um, yeah. thank you for listening. Thank you. I'm not